you for joining me today in my garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this is a walk in the garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Station in beautiful Norfolk, Massachusetts. And this is December, and it's a cold day. Uh, the wind has added to the wind chill. Actually, there is sun, and the temperatures aren't too bad, but the wind is whipping around, and that's why I'm out picking up sticks. Many days, this winter, I have been doing that, trying to keep up with it so that it isn't too bad come spring. I'm in my herb garden, but you can't really see too many herbs because they're covered with oak leaves. And oak leaves provide a great mulch. If you have an oak tree, the oak leaves are a super mulch because they don't uh, mat down like maple leaves. They stay kind of crispy and blowy, and once they get into an area like this where it's terraced, they just provide a really nice winter mulch. Air goes between the layers and protects some of the plants. Most herbs are quite hardy in our area. Those that are tender, I take inside or I replant each year. So this one's ready for winter. All of my little herb labels have been taken inside. I know where the herbs are and can recognize them now. Of course, you'd want to leave them out if you're unfamiliar with herbs and want to make sure that you recognize them again in the spring. Just make sure your labels are in the ground firmly or they can heave out and then you'll be not knowing where anything is. Any decorations that were out here, my sundial, all of those things have been taken in for the winter and we're just going to let it sit. We had a little snow already and we will get more, no doubt. Snow is also a great insulator, and if you have quite a lot of snow, your plants will be really happy because they are insulated by it. The ground, I don't believe, is fully frozen yet, but it will be probably in the next couple weeks with the temperatures. Again, I'm picking up, then that's about all I can do. They can use some of the sticks as kindling or just add them to my burn pile for spring. Now let's see what's going on over in the perennial garden. Concrete bird baths are uh, going to freeze if you leave them up and you can either take the top inside or just tip it up next to the bird bath so that it doesn't collect water. I've been doing that because I really am out of storage space for things like this. So that will work quite well. Just lean it up against the bird bath itself to prevent the top from breaking. I don't know that they sell tops separately, but they certainly should because many people do break the top of a concrete bird bath and need a replacement. They usually end up buying another one. I've done that. And so I end up with an extra base. The, the base can be used. Uh, you could set a planter on top of it, as I do. But if you take a little caution, you can save the whole bird bath. I'm going to move over to this bird house. It's a bluebird house, and I've cleaned it out, but I want to leave it open, and I'll probably prop something in it. But the reason I want to leave it open is to prevent mice and uh, little ground squirrels or any other little critters from making a nest in it and chewing it up over the winter. So if you have a bluebird house, just try to leave it open so that uh, nothing is going to nest in it. Other birdhouses I have actually removed from the garden. I'll put them back out in April and May. They seem to last a little longer that way, and again, it keeps mice and other critters from making nests. Now I'm going to move over to the perennial garden. The perennial garden, again, is also covered with oak leaves and a little snow, which is left over from the small, small amount we receive. Uh, it kind of tells you where the shadier parts of this garden are, because the sun hasn't hit this area enough to melt it. I've left many of the perennials standing, and they are ones that have seeds. They're the native ones. They provide homes for beneficial insects over the winter, and they also provide food for birds. So I've left many of the perennials, asters particularly, uh, and other native ones standing. Uh, some plants do put up their green foliage in the fall. That'll probably go as the weather gets colder and it will get new foliage in the spring. Some have green foliage that stays. And again, the uh, work that I've done here, just letting the oak leaves stay or putting more oak leaves on, 
is going to insulate the plants. Those will be removed in the spring in time for the bulbs to come up and bloom in April and May, depending on the weather, probably April. Sometimes we can get in in March, but usually it's April, sometimes early May if we have a very late spring. I've also put straw on some of the more tender plants and oak leaves have gone over those. They uh, give, need a little extra protection. They're hardy to zone six and we live in zone six, but these tend to be a little picky as far as winter winds. So I do cover them with straw. That's the Flomus, and that is an uh, interesting plant with yellow flowers in the spring. I like it, and it seems to do better if I give it a little extra protection. Going down the way, this is the uh, butterfly weed, and there are still seed pods hanging on. They add a little interest in the winter, and the birds can still get some of the seeds out. And moving down this way, are the baskets that I've put over my chrysanthemums and lavender plants. And I just put a rock on top of them and they'll stay until spring. And I have oak leaves inside of those containers. Uh, you could put other insulating material inside there if you wished. But oak leaves seems to work well for me and that's what I have, so that's what I use. I'm noticing tracks out here. Uh, when you get a little snow, it's fun to go out and do a little tracking. There are so many things online that can help you identify the tracks. Uh, I see rabbit and I see squirrel at this point in this area. Often I will see deer. And when I start to see deer tracks and see evidence that they might have uh, nibbled on something, I will definitely come out and spray. There are several things that they will eat this winter and that would be azaleas and hollies. And I have some of each in this garden. So I will want to spray those items for deer at least once during the winter. And more often if I see uh, evidence that the deer are running through the yard every day. And once we have more snow, that will become obvious. Again, right now what I'm seeing are just little rabbit tracks and cat or squirrel tracks here and there, and of course bird tracks too. Now let's head down to the vegetable garden. We're just taking a quick run today, and I try to get out here about once a day. At this point I've shut off the electric fence, but I've kept the inner fence, the wire fence, still connected to encourage other things from not getting into the garden. My strawberries and garlic are covered with uh, straw, and also parsley is covered with straw. Some of the plants are still standing. I still have kale, and on a sunny day, I can probably come out and pick enough kale for a salad. Kale is extremely hardy, and it perks up every time we have a warm spell. Other plants will need to be pulled come spring. Sometimes I do it in the fall, other times I don't. So this year I didn't do it, and we uh, have been picking arugula and kale and broccoli very late in the season. Also some parsley. I've set up my burn pile and I keep adding to that as I pick up the sticks in the yard. We'll be burning once uh, permits are available sometime in late January. I don't usually get around to burning until maybe April and it ends May 1st. So you, March and April are the times to do any outdoor burning if you have things collected. Uh, sticks and things like branches uh, because other times of the year open burning is not allowed in Norfolk. The garden, as I said, will pretty much take care of itself. Everything that, that needs to be mulched has been mulched and everything that needs to be harvested has been harvested. So we're all set. Uh, the broccoli, as I said, was one of the later things and we were getting broccoli up until Thanksgiving. I've pruned a few evergreens and filled my containers with evergreens and some holly that I've also pruned. Uh, and also I, I uh, cut back red twig dogwood and used that in my containers as well. I have used almost everything in this container, well everything, I won't say almost because it is everything, 
came from our, my own yard in the way of prunings. I've also done my window boxes and used some uh, twigs as well as the redwood, red twig dogwood branches. It just kind of perks them up for the winter. Now these will be frozen in, so I won't be taking these apart until things thaw in the spring. Some of the containers, all of the con containers are placed in areas where I want to keep a path. Uh, it shows where you can take the snowblower, for instance, instead of going over my plants. Uh, so they kind of mark the area where it's okay to use equipment through the area. And this will stay for the winter. They just add a little color, and I enjoy making them up. The only thing is you have to do it before they freeze. So this year I was lucky in that it was warm enough uh, right after Thanksgiving that I was able to come out and fill these containers to decorate them. You could put ribbons on them if you wish. We've had too much wind lately to have a good ribbon stay in place. But they're a lot of fun to make, and each year they're a little different, and I enjoy having them. And now let's go back to the back part of the garden. I have more decorations back there. The shade garden's kind of quiet right now, a little snowy because it is a shade garden and the sun doesn't penetrate enough to melt the snow in the shade. Uh, a lot of little tracks here, squirrels, birds, they've been around quite a bit. Uh, we see the squirrels in the trees every day and also at the bird feeder. Not everything is white or brown though. We have uh, helibores and they keep their foliage all winter, keep it green. So I do have green spots here and there pretty much all winter. And also the uh, vinca that's a ground cover stays green. Uh, the shrub over here is a lacothe way and it stays green as well. And you can pick its branches also to use in arrangements and bring them inside and they don't curl up when it gets snowy like rhododendrons do. So they're very nice to use in outdoor containers as well as indoor containers. It's a nice shrub and it likes the shade. So it's uh, native, I think a little further south of here, but uh, it grows very nicely here. And as our climate becomes a little warmer, I'm sure it will become a regular in this area. The other thing that's green is Christmas fern. And that may be part of why it got its name, although people say it got its name because each individual little part of a uh, fern frond looks like a Christmas stocking, if you look very closely at it. I still think it's because it stays green through Christmas, in fact, through spring. So Christmas fern is another evergreen plant. Otherwise, the area gets very bleak, and I like to have green that I can see out of my windows. So these plants provide it. The pond has a slight coating of ice on it at this point, and my ice melter, unfortunately, is not doing what it's supposed to as far as sitting on top of the water. However, it is melting a spot in the ice, which is the purpose of it. So I'm gonna just leave it alone and not replace it until it doesn't do that. Uh, there is a, an area that is not frozen and that's what I want in the pond so that any gases that the fish create can escape. Every once in a while you can see the fish slowly floating around under there. They're just little orange blobs. Sometimes the ice is clearer than others. There's a few in there today. I don't know if the camera can catch them or not. I also have a flue tile in there and they like to hide in there in the winter. They go in there quite often and just kind of stay in there. My uh, heron that's been out all summer is going to get stored away now that there's ice on the pond because any heron that comes through will not be able to get through the ice. I guess they do stay here all winter, but we'll just put this heron into the shed where he can spend the winter. My shed with its uh, plexiglass side window stays nice and warm and I can work out here almost any sunny day. 
It does get very cold at night, and when there's no sun, it stays cold. But on a day like today, the temperature's well into the 70s inside. So it's a nice place to do uh, just some tasks, maybe a little woodworking or something a little messy, painting, anything like that that you can do during the sunny part of the day. I've decorated out here with an old sled, a ribbon, and a pine cone on some greens, and a little wreath also with some greens and ribbon. Again, they cheer up the area in the winter. I leave my winter decorations up well into February, if not more, just to add a little winter cheer when the earth gets mostly white. The other plant that's green is the uh, ginger, and that's a uh, ground cover over this way, and it stays green all winter too, but it's usually covered with snow, so I guess that doesn't count, does it? I've left up a few of the plants here, the ferns and the grasses. Again, they provide some homes for beneficial insects, maybe some forage for the rabbits, we will spray a little if we see evidence of deer. The deer particularly like holly. At some points they will go after the evergreens and the uh, other shrubs. So again, I keep my eye open and make sure that I've sprayed at least once and then about every six weeks, unless there are evidence of a lot of deer in the area. We have not had as many deer in our area the last few years because of a great deal of building going on in town. I planted this winter blooming cherry about 30 years ago and it dependably blooms both in the spring and in the late fall. And it's been blooming now. Here in December, I have little cherry blossoms on this tiny tree. Uh, the tree has grown, it's not so tiny anymore, but uh, it is a small understory tree and it does bloom. It's been full of bloom since about Thanksgiving. They're just finishing up right now, but we were able to get a shot of just a few of the blooms that are still on it. It will bloom again in the spring and then again next fall. So it's kind of an interesting little tree. And the blooming of many shrubs this fall has been a little erratic. This is not erratic. It does bloom in the fall and that's what it's supposed to do. It's a winter blooming cherry. I'm filling bird feeders almost daily. Uh, the birds have really been uh, hungry lately, especially now that the temperatures are starting to drop. We put a baffle on this one to hopefully keep the squirrels out. It doesn't work, so if you're considering a baffle, you may want to just save your money because they figure it out and uh, unless the Maybe if the bird feeder is all by itself and very high, it does work a little better. But this one being a shorter height, and it has to be so I can fill it, because I'm a short person, uh, it just doesn't help at all. It does keep the little red squirrels out pretty well, but the gray squirrels are able to jump right over it. In fact, they use it as a springboard to get to the feeder. So I do feed a lot of squirrels, but they're kind of fun to watch too. Also, I have several bird feeders. I feed sunflower seeds, which get all over the place, but in the spring we clean it up and everything will be fine. I also feed a mixed seed mixture for the little birds, the chickadees and the wrens and the sparrows, and some suet in the uh, side baskets on this feeder, and that appeals greatly to the woodpeckers, which we enjoy seeing. And we have large ones and small ones, uh, the red-bellied woodpecker, which actually doesn't have a red belly, it has a red neck, and also the downy and hairy woodpeckers, which are the smaller woodpeckers that come to the feeders. It's fun to see the birds. If you are really interested and do a lot of bird watching, you can uh, participate in several bird watches that uh, Mass Audubon and National Audubon and the uh, couple of the universities sponsor in the fall. They'll be online and they'll be looking for people to fill out a one-day bird record of what you see at your feeder. It's kind of fun to do, to know what birds you have visiting. And so having a bird book is also nice if you don't have one. Maybe you'd like to ask Santa to bring you one this Christmas. 
Now let's go inside and do some indoor decorating and some cooking. Today I'm going to make some holiday arrangements and I'm going to use three different methods to secure the uh, flowers. You need to have some water to keep the greens fresh if you're making an arrangement. And there are several ways to do it. One of the most popular ways is to use a product called Oasis. Unfortunately, it is a plastic product and environmentally not great. But it is useful and the florists use it quite a bit. It's soaked in water and you need to soak it for quite a long time to get it really saturated. And then you can put your greens in it or anything else. I'm using it in this white container and there's a plastic insert in here that will hold some water if I wish to water it later a little more. But I want to add some sticks and these are red twig dogwoods and I've used them several years in a row and I went out to get them this year and they really had lost their red color. So I got out some spray paint and I sprayed my red twig dogwood pieces with some spray paint and then I wiped it off because it actually was making them a little too red. And I'm going to just put three of these in and the foam works in this container best because it holds those in place. And then I can add my greens. And poke it right in. And you want to make sure you clean the needles off the base of any greens you're using. And we'll set up some white pine. I picked a, a variety from my garden to add. And I'll start out with some white pine. And just keep clipping it. have some other evergreen shrubs that can always use a little pruning about this season. And the idea here is to we have some arborvitae that's good for the small edges. I'll cut some of that and again pull off a piece where it'll go into the medium and this is very good for covering edges and many people do have an arborvitae shrub if you find you want to replace your piece always clip the end again because uh, pushing it into this foam seals the end of the piece and you need to be able to have it take up water while it's in there. And I also have hemlock. Plenty of that that I can add. And I'm trying to keep this not too tall. The idea is to completely cover the oasis. There's another product called Sahara, which is also a plastic material. And Sahara is for dry arrangements. It will not hold water. It's for dried flowers only. And we'll keep digging in here. And we have some holly as well. So we'd like to add some holly. And a lot of my holly, the berries are in the middle. So I will kind of creatively clip some, some off the top to put in to give a view of those berries. And then some of the holly I'll put in even without berries. We 
Oops. It gets a little messy, which is a good idea to do it on a floor that you can clean up later. And put this one in. Unfortunately, the holly that's outside that I have has all been consumed by the robins who stayed late this year, as they often do. Some of them even stay year round, I'm sure. And the robins completely cleared the holly and the winterberry bushes that I have of their berries. They find them quite delectable. And again, we'll just keep adding pieces here and there. And I have a bucket and back for some of the scraps. Let's see how this is looking. It's coming, it needs a little more here and there of many things that we could add. This is a piece of the Lakothwe that I spoke about. Again, I'll pull a bottom leaf off and add a few pieces of that. It's a broadleaf evergreen. And a bit of cedar. It's amazing what you can do with just the prunings from your yard. And we're going to do uh, several of these arrangements. My cameraman here may want to speed it up a little bit. I have a few uh, pieces of artificial greens that I might want to add. And these, there's three, three in this little bunch. And I have some wire cutters here so I can shorten them up a little bit. Well, we can add a few pieces of sparkle into it. And then maybe some a figure. And I have a nice little bird here. And again, we probably need to shorten it down a little bit for this arrangement. We'll just put the little bird in. And there's one of our arrangements for today. And I'm going to put that over here. The next arrangement that I'm going to do is a larger one. And this is, has a filler in it. And what I'm going to do is use chicken wire. If you don't want to use plastic, there are several ways to do it. One is to use chicken wire, and that is what I will do with this one. And then I put a small glass, and this was a uh, jar that some jelly came in, and one that I would normally recycle. But you can add water to those and put your greens in, into the water. So that they do have water and that Whoever has the arrangement then can water it. But the chicken wire that's been kind of formed together will hold the greens for the arrangement. And this is Santa's sled. And we'll just start poking the greens in and fill it up. Again, you want to hide the mechanics. That's the the main thing, the things that held it together, you really don't want to see those. There we are. And then we can add something like Santa to his sleigh. This is just a little Christmas ornament. But we can add that into the front of it. And let's see what else we might need in here. Maybe a bit of the Lacoste way.
And if you wish, you can also add a bow. Oh, we have a ribbon bow we can add. And pine cones also. Perhaps a little bird. Up here, that will stay. Need to go down a little further. It's a little heavy for that branch. But you can add all sorts of things, whatever you wish. I think this one I'll use there. I do have some sticks, and you can add pine cones by wrapping the wire on the stick around the pine cone. and then twisting it. And this gives you something for the pine cone to fit in. And then it can just fit in, in like that. Mm. Add a few of those. One more. It's nice to work in uneven numbers if you can, either ones or maybe threes if, rather than twos or fours when you're adding things like pine cones. Sometimes you need a bit of other wire. This one may not be long enough to hold it, but I think it is. And there we have another type of an arrangement, a little sleigh with Santa in it. And I can't see it from the front, but uh, you can keep adding if you wish. And this one, again, we'll just uh, add some of the holly. Cut that off and put it in the water. And then we'll fill in around it with uh, pine and arborvitae. And again, we want to cover the edges on this one. This one, uh, I'm going to have to cut off some of these smaller pieces. Here's where the arbovite is very good at covering edges. It kind of hangs over. This shrub as well. Holly is there. sticking in a little better. Oh, we want to fill this right up. This as full as we can. And maybe some of the broadleaf evergreen as well. that piece. Let's try a piece here. Again, trying to keep your foliage out of the water is kind of important because that will go faster that way. And then a 
use one of my wires around this wreath or this uh, ribbon. And we can add that to the arrangement. And I just used a little uh, container that I found at a flea market for this one. It makes a good little gift. Uh, any of these, you can add some other things like uh, red balls or leave them more natural. Another thing I have are some artichokes that I sprayed gold. I think I like that better in this one. And we have plenty of seed pods, and this is uh, Sedum Autumn Joy, and that works really well in the arrangement. Hydrangeas, if you have a larger arrangement. I've dried all these items. These are uh, Verbena bonariensis. These also are kind of nice to put into a, an arrangement. And I think I hopefully have about three of those to put in. Well, at least I should have another one in there somewhere. And again, you can spray some of these with gold spray paint. And they look nice in the arrangement. And also poppy pods. Poppy pods and iris pods are also things you can use. Uh, this is a firm frond from just a common fern, and that too can be used. And some of the other things would be for airiness, you can use uh, a stilby blossoms that have gone to seed. We can add those. I sprayed that with a little uh, gold spray paint too. And I'll just poke that in. It adds a little color. And let's put uh, the fern frond in here too. Mainly it's just having fun with some of the things you've collected and picked. And again, uh, adding some of these little, little extra things to the arrangement can be fun. The other thing you can add when you're finished is lights. And these are pretty inexpensive and they can just be trailed around and through your arrangement. You'd like to keep this, this part of it out of the water. And uh, they just turn on with a little switch. And the switch can be kind of hidden down in the arrangement or along the back of it. Probably along the back of it is better in this case because we do have water in this one. So we'll just put it in back where it's not too visible and just tuck these little strands of tiny lights in among the greens. So there's another, another arrangement. It's fun. Uh, this is the, why you saved all these lovely weeds and kept them for making things, and this is what we're going to make with these things. Uh, again, I have a whole basket full of various things that could be added. Uh, another thing would be teasel pods. And teasel is basically a field weed. And it has very spiny stems. And I found that if you take a piece of sandpaper and sand the stem, then it's easy to work with. If you don't use the sandpaper on it, you're going to have little sprinkles in your hand uh, as you use it. So. Uh, little slivers. So you want to be sure that you do something like spray it uh, with something or sand it down with a piece of sandpaper. That's the best way to work with it. The other thing I'm going to sh show are uh, cuttings have been growing really well and we'll be dividing those in, in January, February. I put three cuttings to a pot and I will 
be repotting them so that there's one cutting in each pot because they're growing too big and they need more water and nutrients than the single pot for three cuttings can provide. The other thing I'll do in January, let me move this back, is start watering, and we lost our, start watering my amaryllis plants. I've got a number of amaryllis bulbs that have been brought inside, planted, but just kept dry. So now's the time you want to water those and put them in a sunny spot and they will start to grow. And by late January or February, you should have amaryllis. Many people like to have them for Christmas, but I have so many other Christmas decorations and I like to make these arrangements that I really don't need the amaryllis now. But once I've taken the Christmas decorations all down and these have all been added to the compost pile, then I need some color. So I want my amaryllis a little later, more like Valentine's Day. So I will start watering them now instead of in November and I'll have color into the late winter. Now let's go into the kitchen and do a little seasonal cooking. The first thing I'm gonna to put together today is this uh, sausage and cheese quiche. I'm putting together the items for a Christmas brunch or breakfast. And I've already browned the sausage and now I'm going to just cook the onion and the red pepper a little bit. The recipe calls for a pound of sausage and a half a cup of onion and a third of a cup of chopped green pepper, but I thought due to the holiday season, I would use red pepper. And we're gonna just saute that in some of the sausage fat, about two tablespoons that was left. I drained the sausage and I will just saute that until they're soft. There are those things have been cooked. I'm gonna add the sausage back in to my pan. And we'll add a few other things now too. I'm going to add a cup and a half of shredded cheese. And I used a nice yellow cheese. And a tablespoon of flour. And I'm gonna mix these items together. And I'm gonna put it into my pie shell, which is uh, just a single deep dish pie shell if you're buying frozen, or you can make your own. And we're gonna just distribute that evenly. And then we need to make a batter to go on top. And that's going to be two eggs. one cup of evaporated milk, and we'll whisk that together. And then we need some seasonings. And I'm going to add a tablespoon of chopped parsley leaves. And this is parsley that uh, I picked from my garden. And if you have watched my show before, you know that I keep my parsley in a glass jar in the refrigerator and it lasts a very long time. Just with the water that, uh, after you've washed it and then just shake it off, put it in the jar, it will last well into winter. I also want to add some pepper. About a half a teaspoon of grated black pepper. And some seasoned salt. 
They call for seasoned salt. Uh, to cut down on the sodium, I'm going to use a salt-free mixture. And I'll add about a half teaspoon of that. And a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder. Or perhaps a little less. Mix that. And pour it over our quiche and spread it out so that it covers the whole thing. I'll put this in the oven for 35 to 40 minutes. Oh, we've lost a piece of cheese. Let's see. And set the timer. And that's at 350. The next thing I'm going to make is a stolen. And a stolen is a an old German bread. And I, when I say old, I mean old. I looked it up, and it's been being made in Dresden, Germany, since the 1400s. The initial stolons were made without butter and eggs by edict of the pope at the time. So the recipe that I use is not the yeasted bread that is popular in Dresden, Germany now. Now they do add uh, eggs and butter and milk, and it's a yeasted bread that's made every year. They even have a big festival. They make huge ones that feed hundreds of people. It's very popular in Germany. It's a fruited bread, and many of them have a lot of candied fruit and nuts. Uh, I have followed this recipe from King Arthur Flour, and I like it a little better than the traditional one, which I have also made. It takes a lot less time, and it is not a yeasted bread. It's a, uh, a quick bread, as it were, but it still lasts a very long time. I also don't like to use the candied fruit. I use just dried fruit, which we'll add later. But I'm going to start out with the two and a quarter cups of flour, add a half a cup of granulated sugar, and one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, and a half teaspoon of salt. And I'll stir that together. And I'm going to add a half a cup of butter cut in cubes. That's one whole stick of butter. And we're going to mix that around till it makes kind of crumbs. And you can kind of mix it a bit. But you want the particles of butter to stay in the pastry itself. I'm going to add my fruit and nuts to this mixture. And I'm, going, I'm just using cranberries and chopped apricots, dried apricots. And that would be, you want a, a total a cup of fruit. And you can use raisins or other fruits, currants, raisins, any other type of dried fruit that you wish. And then also, we want to add a third of a cup of slivered toasted almonds. And I'll add those to the flour mixture so that they can uh, be covered with flour. And then in a separate bowl, I'm going to mix together a half cup, or a cup, I'm sorry, a cup of ricotta cheese and one egg. And we need to add some vanilla extract. And 
a bit of lemon oil if you have it. You could also use a little grated lemon peel. I'll just add a little. And I want to mix that well. And I'll mix that into the flour mixture. Very different recipe in that it does use ricotta cheese as the end. I'm using the part skim type rather than the full fat. And then we mix that in and to dampen the flour. And here's where things get a little interesting, and I found that it's easier just to do it with clean hands. And to work it together. At this point I can take it out of the bowl. And again, continue to knead it a little bit. And then I'm going to form it on a piece of parchment on a baking sheet. And the traditional form for a stolen would be to roll it or pat it to about seven by eight inches. And then fold it over, not quite completely over. And press it down so that it will stay folded. And you'll notice I just have one stolen. I did do a half recipe. I gave you the ingredients that would make two stolen. So if you follow what I said, or the recipe on the King Arthur uh, flour recipe site for their quick stolen, you will get two loaves instead of just one. Once this has been formed into the traditional stolen shape, we're gonna put it in the oven at 325 degrees and bake that for 35 to 40 minutes. Once it's finished, I will be brushing it with melted butter and coating it with a coating of confectioner's sugar. That again is also traditional. Then once it's cooled, you repeat the process of melted butter and powdered sugar. And that gives it the traditional uh, white coating. Now, the next thing I wanna make is another old recipe that was popular probably a long time. Oranges were very hard to get in many parts of the country back 50, 60, 70 years ago. And oranges for Christmas were kind of traditional. They came in your Christmas stocking, one orange to a customer. And so oranges have always been a part of my Christmas celebration. And I'm making ambrosia today. And ambrosia is a, actually a southern dish which is kind of tropical fruits and coconut. And I make a very simple one. Uh, some of the recipes call for marshmallows, whipped cream, all kinds of things. I just use fruit. And what I'm using is uh, pineapple and uh, oranges. And I've cut the oranges in sections and the pineapple I purchased, although you can do your own pineapple, and any larger pieces, I'll just cut in smaller pieces and combine it with the oranges. So we have a, a nice, this is a, again for a breakfast meal, so I don't want a lot of other ingredients in it. This is just oranges. You could also use clementines. You could also use mandarin oranges if you just want to open a can. 
and get those out. Uh, before I did the oranges, I had to peel them, of course. And uh, every once in a while, I need orange zest in my cooking. So what I did was uh, zested the oranges with this zester and a microplane and put them the orange peel in a plastic bag and labeled it. This will go in the freezer. Then when I need some, I can just break off a piece and I'll have some orange zest without having to buy oranges if I don't happen to have any in stock. The last thing I'm gonna to add to my ambrosia is coconut and I'm just using sweetened coconut and mixing that in. And because it's Christmas, I'll garnish it with a few cherries along the way. And these are ones with, with stemmed cherries. We'll put a few of those on top. Another Christmas tradition at my house was stuffed dates. And I realize now that those are the sugar plums. I looked up sugar plums. They were popular from the 17th century. And they consisted of a hard sugar coating on uh, nuts or seeds or fruits. Uh, from the time I was a little girl, I was able to make these uh, stuffed dates. And what they consisted of was a nice plump date and I did get some nice ones this year. Stuffed with a pecan and rolled in sugar. The later versions of sh what they call sugar plums has become a candy that's made with dried fruits and nuts and a sugar coating. So these would be your sugar plums if you're watching the nutcracker and want to know what sugar plums are. These make very nice sugar plums if you're serving them. Now let's go into the dining room and see our entire meal on the table for a festive brunch. So our brunch is ready. Uh, I took the quiche out of the oven and garnished it with a few cherry tomato halves and some parsley. Again, from the garden, I have two jars, one with the Italian parsley, the flat leaf Italian parsley, and one with the curly parsley. This is the curly parsley. Uh, the flat leaf parsley is in the quiche itself. We have some orange juice, and you could add some champagne if you are, would like, or maybe some ginger ale if you have children to give, make it a little special, and use some special glasses too. We have our ambrosia and the stolen, and the stolen has its uh, nice coat of white powdered sugar, and it will last if you have any left for a week or so. If you've covered it well, wrapped it well, it will last at room temperature for about a week. Uh, it's very moist with the inclusion of the ricotta cheese. I wanna wish everyone happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, or whatever holiday you're celebrating this season. I hope you have family and friends to join you and have a wonderful holiday season. I'm Liz Davey and this has been a walk in the garden on NCTV Norfolk Community Cable.